Well, I want to speak about the diversity of God's grace upon our lives and especially them that have been assigned to serve God in different capacities. You know, extending, of course, to the offices that have been established by the Lord Himself when He ascended. Of course, He gave different persons in terms of uh, ministers that are meant to carry out the gospel of the kingdom. Now, why I have to simply share on this, I know it's not quite unknown. It is known, has been preached, has been talked about different forums, different platforms across the entire globe. But then this is kind of just try to simply once again encourage us all that are within the sphere of ministry, them that are serving the Lord from different kind of you know levels. And Paul, one of the men of God that was greatly used of God, wrote so much of the New Testament, which of course was great benefit to their Gentile community. And of course, partly also he was able to reach out to the Jews, but largely the kind of a ministry he was carrying was more like set out for the Gentiles, as we well know very well when you study even the calling of Apostle Paul and even how God spoke to him about that which he's supposed to do in terms of the kingdom mandate. But then looking at some of the the writings of Apostle Paul, they were quite enlightening, they were quite uh, informative, they were able to simply help any person that has a great desire to do ministry effectively. Uh, if you're able to simply take time and study the writings of Apostle Paul, then um, so persuaded that indeed you're able to carry out the ministry effectively even as the Holy Spirit guides and helps you, helps you rather and helps me as well. But you realize that in the recent past there's been a lot of conflict of service when it comes to serving the Lord. Uh, there has been a witness of strife, envy, jealous of every kind, you know, from different angles when it comes to ministry. And this sometimes, you know, even gives the enemy an advantage over the body of Christ. Why? Because when men and women of God, and especially the upcoming generation, find themselves in the, the realms of conflict, uh, trying to do each other, outplay each other, one thing that I do understand very well from the scriptures is that the Holy Spirit cannot simply be behind any form of conflict, neither any form of competition when it comes to the things of the kingdom. I believe that the Holy Spirit that has been assigned by God the Father for the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ He's meant to simply create harmony and order where uh, carrying out the kingdom mandate is concerned. And uh, he's not the author of any form of confusion or even conflict. Christ said pretty well that a kingdom divided among itself cannot stand. And therefore, over time, I've been able to witness a lot of conflict and I'm not simply speaking from the position of when people uh, present the gospel or rather simply carry out the gospel in a way that is erroneous you know mispresentation of the gospel or false hold I'm not talking about that I'm just talking about sound ministers that simply you can see from a father these are sound and genuine ministers of the gospel yet there is this tendency of trying to outdo one another but when you look at the biblical principles as the Buddha of Christ we are not in any mode of competition 
what God demands from each and every minister, each and every person that is carrying out the work of God is faithfulness. Faithfulness is what God expects. Paul says that a steward ought to be found faithful in order for them to be trusted by the Lord. That every steward ought to be faithful. We ought to be a people that can be trusted in carrying out this kingdom assignment. So being accountable, being faithful is extremely paramount where God is concerned. So how do we simply avert this uh, issue of competitiveness, this issue of trying to do each other? If we are all subject to the Holy Spirit, I don't think that we can simply take credit to the thing that the Holy Spirit does through us as vessels. I don't think that we can take credit or neither take the glory. I don't believe that we can simply say like Christ said, the things that I do is not I, but my Father liveth in me. So when we simply allow the Holy Spirit to take the lead and to be the one that is simply doing the things that God has ordained to be done through us, I want to believe beyond any shadow of doubt, no any single person will simply display self-exaltation or will simply begin to become egoistic or begin to downplay others or look down upon others. Why? Because we are all doing, the intention is one, to glorify the Father. The objective of serving God is to ensure that we do that which is pleasant to Him. The end game is to glorify the Lord. That is what we ought to simply understand. But then, let's look at what Paul said in Romans chapter number 12. says in verse number 3 of uh, Romans 12 for as for by the grace and merited favor of God given to me one everyone among you to estimate and think of himself more highly than he ought not uh, uh, than he ought to not to have an exaggerated opinion of his own importance but to read his ability with sober judgment, each according to the degree of faith apportioned, uh, apportioned by God to him. Verse 4, which I want us to simply capitalize on that. For as in one physical body we have many parts, organs, members, and all these parts do not have the same function. Now, Paul uses as an analogy. Of course, I want to speak of the diversity of God's grace upon all of us, as I said initially. But then Paul uses an analogy of a body. And then look at our body. We will discover that we have different types of, you know, body parts and body organs. Some of our body organs are not visible. Unless someone is undergoing a surgery, the doctors can be able to view some of the organs. We only hear about them, we have been taught about them. But nowhere at any time, you and me, unless you're going through scanning or x-ray, those kind of you know stuff. But in a normal way, you can't even see your intestines, you can't see your heart, you can't see you are, let me just talk about those body organs that are within. We can't see them yet, they're part of us. Then we have those visible body parts that can be seen, our eyes, our ears, our head, our hands, our legs, our toes, our feet, our fingers. Those are body parts that are able to be seen. So Paul says, these body parts functions differently. Each and every body part has its own assignment. But the time when these parts are supposed to function may not be, uh, it may differ. And so he says that, you know, as in one physical body, we have many parts, 
parts, organs, members, all these parts do not have same function or use. Yeah, he creates, he, he, he puts a clear, a kind of, a clear, uh, kind of, you know, uh, distinction where body parts or organs are concerned. And you look at it uh, on a real, in, in the real, uh, in, in a kind of, you know, when you look at it, uh, clearly you discover that actually he is quite uh, real in what he's saying that this body parts functions differently. I know that sometimes this becomes quite challenging to a lot of people but I can't listen with my eyes but I can listen with my ears. You know, I can't eat with my ears but I can eat with my mouth at the end of the day. I cannot write with my knees, but I can use my hands to write at the end of the day. So, every single body part has its special function when the circumstances demand for the function to be put into uh, play or to be put in place. So Paul uses that and simply gives us a picture of the body of a person and he says once you're able to have a clear understanding about how the body functions the body parts functions on each and every person's body then he says verse number five so we numerous as we are are one body in Christ we are one body in Christ the Messiah and individually we are parts of another. This is to say that we are interdependent. We work jointly but differently. We have been joined together. We are one in Christ Jesus and we have been given different kind of abilities to function yet joined in that very body of Christ. And it says mutually dependent on one another. So no minister can simply stand and say, well, I can do everything by myself. No, it can't happen. There are people that have been given different abilities according to verse number six. Having gifts for qualities, talents, qualities that differ according to grace given us. Now, given us, let us use them. He who, whose gift is prophecy, let it prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. Now, Paul helps us to understand that the grace of God, all these abilities, the giftings, the potential that has been accorded us, is, you know, these gifts are distinguished on the basis of grace. So meaning, when you have a gift, that gift does not just come void of grace. The gift comes according to the grace. So everyone that is gifted, everyone that has particular abilities, supernatural abilities, these people don't function in the absence of grace. They function as by the grace. The grace of God enforces, brings effectiveness. We are carrying out the kingdom assignment is concerned. Now, why do I say all this? The grace of God is what simply determines each and everyone's function in as much as you are gifted. And refusal to acknowledge the grace of God upon your life as a person or upon another person's life, then you'll begin to simply find yourself appearing to be much more uh, like competitive against another person that is within the same, same realm of God's kingdom, carrying out the same mandate that God has given us, of course, but of course operating differently based on the grace. And when this is not appreciated, but when people are not discovered, 
the kind of grace that they carry upon their lives you'll find people begin to replicate what others are doing you'll find people begin to simply run the race that is not theirs you'll begin to find people trying to simply do that which does not reflect the grace of God upon their lives and this will end people in a state of bitterness jealous envy than playing other persons the grace of God will always erase every struggle the grace of God makes one to serve with joy with gladness you enjoy what you're doing when the grace of God is bestowed upon you so once you are able to identify and understand the kind of grace that God has bestowed upon you like you stay focused you don't get easily distracted by what others are doing we are doing we, our objective is one our intention is one the end game is one to simply glorify the master the operation is different based on the grace that we carry there are some that are graced in different kind of abilities there are people that can do different kind of you know uh, works in the kingdom of God there are those that are good in pastoral there are those that are good in and, and I'll say this thing the grace of God is accorded by God not by man God grants us his grace by spirit when come to the school because the one that called each and every person is God not mankind you can call another person into ministry on behalf of God it is God that calls man into his kingdom assignment it is him that calls them then once they are called of course they'll definitely go through the process of being equipped being trained they'll go through that training process which is quite critical but as they do so and that they keep praying and they keep on studying eventually they begin to discover the area which simply befits them in carrying out the kingdom mandate and there can never be anything to do with competition because the Bible says too much is given much is required very very important you know when you look at Apostle Paul here Paul was simply addressing the Corinthian believers because they were acting in a more carnal way which I still perceive in our time it is also predominantly taking place amongst the Saints Paul was able to give the, the kind of you know the negative effect that came as a result of some of these current believers not growing and being mature enough he says in verse number two of first Corinthians rather verse number one of first Corinthians chapter 3 says however brethren I could not talk to you as spiritual men but as non spiritual men of the flesh in all uh, in whom carnal nature predominates as main friends in new life in Christ and able to talk I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for strong enough to be ready for it. Not yet, uh, for you are not yet strong enough to be ready for it, but even yet you are not strong enough to be ready for it. For you are still unspiritual, having the nature of the flesh under control of ordinary impulses, for as long as there are envy, jealous, jealousy, wrangling functions among you, you are you not unspiritual? And of the flesh having yourselves after the human standard and like mere unchanged men now look at what it says for one when one says I belong to Paul and another belong to Apollos are you not proving yourselves ordinary unchanged men let me put this across to all of us for us to understand that when one gets born again we belong to the body of Christ not to the body of a person it is Christ who died for our sin redeemed us delivered us from the bondage of darkness so we are subject to Christ while the men and women of God are being given the assignment to nurture to you know nurture to teach sanctification to teach purification to teach maturity where the saints are concerned but we are all subject to the body of Christ we are you know we belong to Christ but here these current believers were simply trying to create 
this kind of uh, they're, they're trying to portray this much like oh I belong to Paul others I belong to you know to Apollos no we are not supposed to point out believers to men but point believers to Christ we are not supposed to point believers to us no we are supposed to point believers to God or to Christ who is the Savior of humanity then he says what then is Apollos what is Paul's ministering servants not hails or parties through whom you believed even the Lord appointed as even as the Lord appointed to each his task then Paul says I planted Apollo watered but all the while but all the while uh, but but God all the while was making it grow he gave the increase so Paul says I did the planting but Apollo did the watering and Paul was able to make clear I didn't do the watering when we are cutting out the work together with Apollo no we were simply graced differently in terms of for me I was able to plant but Apollo was able to water but sometimes believers don't understand then Paul comes and says so neither he who plants is anything nor who waters but only God who makes it grow and become greater you see planting and watering is critically important but at the end of the day it is God who simply causes this kind of you know whatever is implanted and watered to grow we can prompt people to grow. it's God that prompts people to grow by spirit then he says he who plants and he who waters are equal one in aim same importance and esteem yet each shall receive his own reward wages according to his own labor you see the grace of God does not simply uh, you know make others superior over others in terms of uh, how can I say in terms of value or importance no Paul says that actually that he who plants and he who waters are equal what makes us equal because we are part of the body of Christ and the equality comes as a result of Christ being the head of the church and we are subject to serve him and more so we have been given grace according to that which you're supposed to carry out so the grace of God does not simply elevate others in order for them to demean others just because I'm not simply defined by my function no when Christ saved me I become a child of God I reflect the I mean my value is derived from God Christ has simply bestowed on me this great value that nothing I think so we cannot confuse the functioning or carrying out the assignment as the one that simply you know uh, bestows on us value no this is just an assignment we have been given and when we use this assignment this functioning to exaggerate our importance we miss out so Paul says the neither who he plants rather verse number eight he who plants and he waters are equal one in aim of the same importance and esteem yet each shall receive his own one according to his own labor now verse 9 it says for we are fellow workmen joint promoters laborers together with and for God you are God's garden and vineyard field under cultivation you are God's building according to the great special element for my task of God bestowed on me like a skillful architect and master builder I laid the foundation now another man is building upon it but let each man be careful how he builds so Paul has us to understand 
Then he says, in according to the grace given to me, I've been able to do my assignment. Of course, the reward will come based on how you've been able to labor. Now, if you're busy competing with another man's labor, and those people that are doing their labor, they have simply their reward ahead, and you're busy doing what they're doing, how will you be rewarded when carrying out other person's labor? We have to be cautious of what God has assigned us to do and stick on that particular assignment based on the grace bestowed on us. We are not in any competition at all. The one that does much is valued. The one that does less is still valued before the Lord. It is God who knows why. He gave each and every person different kind of abilities in order to carry out his agenda. Now we cannot use these abilities to demean, to overlook, to despise each other, or neither to compete against each other, or neither to simply show who is the best and who is not the best. No. Remember, we are all subject to the Holy Spirit as we carry out this kingdom mandate and assignment. So Paul has been able to help us and put things to perspective, and they have said that actually, yes, indeed, there is a reward that's going to come based on each and every person's labor. Then Paul says, I've laid a foundation, every other one is going to build on it, but everybody must be careful how they build. I want to encourage you that is out there carrying out the work of God. If you know perfectly within your heart that this is the area that God has graced me to carry out his assignment, stick to your lane. Stick to that area of your grace and do that which God has prompted you to do to the glory of his name. This takes me back to a time when the late Bonke, of course, he had a church according to one of the books that I had read. He had a church overseas and he was pastoring for quite some time and then God told him, you know, I never called to be a pastor. Why doing that? And God told him, I call it to be an evangelist. And of course, he handed over the church to somebody else. Then that man of God took over the church and the church began to really grow and blossom. Then the man of God, Bonke, began to carry out the evangelistic work. Now, we can all testify them that I've been able to witness, you know, the way his ministry has been done across Africa and of course other parts of the world. The late Brandon Bonke, a great man of God, has been was used greatly in the evangelistic movement. Many souls in millions got saved because the man of God, Bonke, worked within the realm that the within the limits of his grace. He works within the realm of his grace and he carried out that kingdom assignment with so much joy and impact and many many millions of souls can testify on how the men of God impact their lives and minister to them the gospel of grace. So it's very important of course you look at other men of God across the nations you know have men like the late uh, we have Bill Graham we have people like um, uh, uh, Charles Feeney, we have people like A A Allen, those people of those days, you know. We have people like um, John Wesley, we have, they, they were totally, you know, John Knox, you know, they had different kind of grace upon their lives. And when we read, you're able to single out that which they did. You're able to simply like, you know, trace, you can be able to understand that this is what Charles Feeney did. This is what A, A. Allen did. This is what, uh, you know, uh, uh, John Wesley did, this is what John Knox did, this is what uh, Geoffrey did, this is what, you know, Kenneth Hagin did, all these men of God, T.L. Osborne, name all these great men of God, and what they did, because they operated within the realm of their grace. And I want to encourage all of us, no one is less in God's kingdom. The assignment that you're carrying does not simply affirm your value. No, you're really valuable before God. Men can judge you differently because you're doing something less. But before God, you are valuable. Don't let your self-esteem be pegged on what you're doing. No. Your self-esteem, the guidance, the leading is critical, very important. So don't be confused. Don't be caught up in the mix. Stick to your lane. Get to talk to some of the men of God that God has used greatly they'll be able to help you even identify be able to detect to know the area of the grace that God has bestowed upon you rather than finding yourself today you are doing this today you are that today you are that today you are that 
Listen, the title you have does not simply affirm the calling. Paul says, when they saw the grace of God upon me, they gave me the numbers to go and work with me. When they saw the grace of God, that was the minister, the pillars of Jerusalem church at that time, which Peter was one of them, and John and James. The Bible says, when they saw the grace of God upon Paul, they were able to embrace him and, of course, give him someone to go and work along with him. That's what the grace of God does. I mean, when the grace of God is upon you in a particular area, it will be obvious if it's healing, if it's prophecy, if it's uh, evangelistic work, that we have been all called to do with nursing, which is quite okay, but that those that move in higher dimension where evangelistic evangelism is concerned, you know, they're able to pull masses in their numbers and get so many souls getting saved. We do really uh, appreciate that. We have those that are in the apostolic uh, office. We have them that are in the teaching ministers. And, and we do appreciate that diverse kind of grace that bestowed upon each and everyone that is out there to carry God's work. But the problem is, we are always tempted with the standards of the world whereby our self-esteem is pegged on what we do. We want to be honored, humanly speaking, according to the standards of the world. Christ said, I don't crave for human honor or glory or praise, and neither do I seek for that. It's not bad to honor men and women of God, it's good, but the, every man and woman of God, that should not be the drive, that should not be the motivation. That I want to do it so I can be able to get exalted, humanly speaking, or get esteemed in as much as respect men of God is very important, is biblical. But that should not be the motivation behind our kingdom assignment. If that becomes our motivation, then when another one is rising based on the grace we stood upon them, we shall see how we can cut them off. Why? Because it's like the way the late Martin Luther King said, used to say, that we have this syndrome in us, the syndrome of simply desiring for praise. And it's something that is within every human being, that men love praise. We like it when people talk well about us. That is true. We like it. We like attention. We like to be, you know, applauded by people. You know, and it's very important. And at some point, Christ was able to rectify the disciples. You know, there were two disciples that came to Christ. Of course, their mother came, bowed down, and simply said, I pray that my two sons, one may sit on your right and on your left, you know, at your coming. And then, of course, Christ said, of course, it, the left and the right side is not for me. It's the Father who determines that. But then, talked about, are they able to drink the cup that I'm going to? He said, of course, I know they will. But then, a, a positioning positions, that is not uh, within my ability to do so. Then the disciples got angry when they saw that taking place. And they became agitated because how could these two brothers simply be the ones looking on how they can get a better position? But Jesus told them, you know, if anyone wants should be anyone desires to be great among you, then you must be a servant. So greatness is simply reflected in servanthood because Christ saw they had a problem of trying to simply seek for status quo, position oriented persons, but he had to cut them off and say, no, 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 greatness is reflected in servanthood. So anyone that serves authentically, genuinely, faithfully, then they're already within the realm of greatness. According to the definition of Christ. So, as I said again, mine is to encourage all of us. We have so much work ahead of us that we need to carry out. We must carry out while we complement each other, encourage each other, 
support each other by the grace of God. Them that God has assigned to work along your side, stand with them, work with them, support them. And for you, when God brings others you know, on your side, support them, work with them at the end of the day. But I also want to make this clear to you. Not everybody will be impacted by the grace you have. Don't get offended. Don't get discouraged. Because the grace you carry is specified for a particular group of persons. Now that's God's doing. I mean, we have so many ministers of the gospel around the world. And you'll discover that, even for you as a person that is listening and watching, there are men of God you like listening more than others. Not that the others are less or they're less anointed, no. But there is just something that connects you to particular summers of God. That's how it is. No man of God other than Christ can pull every single person to themselves. No. Look at nations, look at cities. Millions of souls have been saved and they go to different, you know, gatherings that are headed by different men and women of God. That's God's doing. Now, you may have 10 people, you may have a thousand, you may have 10,000, you may have 100,000. There's a blessing. Stick just to your lane. When others don't simply embrace the grace you carry, don't be offended. Don't feel you're less. Not every door is your door. Not every nation will open doors for you. Not every city will open doors for you. You will not connect to every man or woman of God. There are specific men and women of God that you can be able to connect and connect too well. And I appreciate that. So that's very important. It's very key. Now when some doors don't open, don't force them. The doors that God has graced you for them, they will open. You will walk in graciously and go carry out what God wants you to carry out. Because at the end of the day, you are not doing your work, you are doing the work of God. There are places that will not be celebrated, there are places that will be celebrated. Why? That's how God has done it. There are places you land like this and everybody goes, wow. And there are places you get and people are like, who is this? You know? You cannot be an all-rounded person that everywhere you go, everybody's like, no, 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 no. I can tell you for sure, the grace of God helps us to simply operate within certain realms that God has ordained us to operate. And I'll say it again. When you go to certain places and people don't embrace you, don't get offended. Don't get discouraged. Just know that that was not the area that God has graced you for. That's why Paul was very known, of course, in Jerusalem. And God told him that your testimony of me in Jerusalem may not be taken, uh, you know, to heart easily based on the story that he had when he was doing that which was opposite to the work of God during his time of opposing the gospel. And therefore God gave him a great mandate to go and simply do more work within the Gentiles community, which of course he has done and the impact is can be witnessed all over. Of course, at the end of the day, he also did some work in Jerusalem, partly, but the other disciples did more work in Jerusalem. Paul says here, Corinthians 15 verse number 9 he says for I am the least worth of the apostles whom I'm not fit to or deserving to be called an apostle because I once wronged pursued molested the church of God oppressing it with cruelty and violence but by the grace and merited favor of favor and blessing of God I am what I am and his grace toward me was not found to be for nothing fruitless without effect in fact i worked harder than all of them the apostles though it was not really i 
but the grace that merit the favor of, of favor and blessing of God which was with me you see Paul is simply acknowledging the fact that when he tried to do to look at what the apostles did and what he did yet the disciples were with Christ physically one-on-one and like Apostle Paul who had an encounter in Acts of Apostle chapter 9 you know had encountered the Lord and of course from there he converted and you know began ministry so he says I was the least among them all actually I've been never I was not even fit to be called an apostle based on my things that I did against the church but because of the grace of God I am what I am he goes further and simply says as a matter of fact the grace of God was not upon me without any effect the effect was evident and he says as a matter of fact I labored more or harder than all the apostles that were there then he goes further and says no it was not I but, but the, the grace of God that was bestowed upon me or that was with me so what made me work harder and more compared to the apostle is the grace of God so if today you are doing more than what others are doing and I don't simply encourage laziness no the grace of God should not be upon us in vain it should help us to simply become more fruitful and more effective in our kingdom assignment so Paul says I labored harder and more than all the apostles but then it was not I but the grace of God now here you are maybe someone you want to compete with the apostle Paul you and Paul Paul had his own assignment Paul went to different parts of the world to preach the gospel you have your own territories you have your own area that God has given you grace to get minister and there is no any single time or day you anyone is going to become like apostle Paul apostle Paul was apostle Paul the grace upon him was for him to carry out that with God that ordained him to carry those days as for you generations have changed things have changed the days of apostle Paul and this particular time very different Paul was there during the days when there was no technology now we have the social media we have all these platforms Paul wasn't there during those days now you cannot simply begin to say I want to be like Apostle Paul you can learn from Apostle Paul you can be inspired by Apostle Paul but you cannot be Apostle Paul you can't be Apostle Peter you can't be Apostle John you can only be the one that God has done you to be and operate within the reins of the grace that God has given you as a person I pray that this message is going to help you you may have had it before it's just kind of a reminder we are all on this together as we await for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ let us carry out this great assignment with joy and gladness we are not in competition no let us not simply employ competition even if as we rectify each other let the rectification not be based on ego or arrogance let be based on love that's very important it simply displays maturity you know you can be right in your own eyes but being right in your own eyes or before people does not simply mean that you're right before God the way God simply looks at us is very different the way we look at ourselves and the way God the way mankind looks at us so I pray that God will look at us in his own way and have the final save of our lives as we carry out his assignment. May the grace of God be enriched upon you in the area of assignment. You and many more others that are out there that during our time we can be able to accomplish that which you're supposed to accomplish to the glory of God. And when others come in, they can also carry on to carry that which we have left behind by the grace of God. Shalom, peace, God bless you to your good. Remain strong and be encouraged as you serve our King of glory in these last days. Shalom, peace, and God be with you. Amen.